one and we're recording we're live i'm with diego how are you my friend very very well i'm i'm very well and thank you for inviting me sunny uh, i love <laughs> what you you told me about going on the podcast it's yeah yeah it is my it is my pleasure it's my honor um you know i usually start with uh where did we first meet that's kind of the first intro um and i'm trying to remember what i do know is your reputation precedes you and i heard about you well before i i met you and i remember very clearly when i heard about you i was in colombia uh you know visiting my wife's family and everywhere i go in the world you know pre covid i guess you could say uh when there was such a thing as traveling i would attend bitcoin meetups everywhere yes. everywhere and so when i when i went to the bitcoin meetup and started interacting with people in in bogota people were like i was like who's like who started these groups where is the guy who's the guy behind this and they're like diego i was like okay where's diego he's like oh no no diego's the godfather of bitcoin in latin america <laughs> i was like say what he's the godfather of bitcoin in latin america i'm like i got to meet this guy so the fact that i'm getting to do an interview with you right now is pretty cool um but yes, where did I, we where, i where don't we... recall if but it, that was in buenos aires or, or it was in what well, i heard in... about you is in bogota in Bogota, but we didn't meet in Buenos Aires for the first time. No, oh, I where did we, we meet? I've never been to Buenos Maybe Aires. Maybe it was consensus or somewhere else. It could but, have been, but, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think we physically met probably in person uh, in, yeah, maybe both. Maybe one of the, uh, I don't know. I am trying to remember, but uh, I, I know I, I know you did come. You were kind enough to come out, fly up to Toronto once uh, a yes. couple years ago as well and present. I love that event. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there was like I don't know, eight hundred, nine hundred people, and I remember you. Yeah, you were... it was like a huge event, and, uh, and so that was awesome. And also, I met Toronto has a great developer community, and I'm still in touch with them and in the groups. So, so I, I awesome. love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The... Awesome, awesome. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. So, anyway, so I guess um, as I was saying, so I'm starting to switch things up a bit. Normally, I start with your story, you know, your RSK, and we go into that, but. Um, but we were going to kind of flip things around and start with maybe my last question first, which is, uh, you know, essentially Peter Thiel's like kind of contrarian belief question, which is what is one truth that you hold that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Well, I think, you know, the, the thing is, I didn't go into Bitcoin because of the monetary aspects of it. So I think... You know, that, that in a way shapes, you know, because I, I didn't come to Bitcoin for, for the monetary aspects of it. I have a very different view on Bitcoin than, than most Bitcoins. I think, you know, most of the early, I, I, I connected on a personal level, did a click with Bitcoin in 2012. And at that moment, I was looking for a solution for a problem that I had been searching for for many years like since the late 90s that was that in my point of view uh, hierarchical structures were the source of corruption so so for, for me concentration of power was the source of corruption not ideology not anything it's like because i was seeing corruption and i was also an activist when i was very young a social activist and, and I was seeing people that have very good intentions, very good values, getting corrupted, being corrupted by, by, power, by power, basically. You know? It's like uh, the more power they were getting, the more corrupt they were. So I was looking for organizational structures that would be you know, distributed or peer-to-peer -peer ways of organizing the society, self-organized self ways of organizing the society. And when I connected to Bitcoin, it's because I saw the seeds for that. I saw the seeds for for a new way of relating. And of course, it has like the monetary elements to it. But but for me, that was what I saw. I said, okay, this is how peer-to-peer -peer societies, uh, you know, should manage their economic relationships. And, and, you know, also I was one of the pioneers of the web uh, back in the 90s. In 1995, I started building the first website for the main newspaper in Argentina. So, so back then in the web, I already had this desire for using these technologies to, to empower individuals, to create a 
truly peer-to-peer -peer society and but i was missing the financial elements and then in bitcoin i found that missing piece that i was looking for so so that's the thing is that for me bitcoin is more a, a tool for social transformation than anything else but of course you know money is at the foundations of society so if you don't disrupt how money and value works then there's no possibility to dis disrupt in anything else no yeah, yeah. So beautifully said. Beautifully said. So, so Diego, let let let's maybe then do the the story question because uh, you know when you say you were a big part of the internet, I've actually heard of that as well, and you've I think mentioned it, and uh, others have mentioned it. But really curious to to kind of rewind a little bit and go back to those early days and figure out like kind of you know what is it that you saw in the internet and and what did that experience look like and what did that teach you that that you know kind of enabled you later on to grasp um, Bitcoin. Absolutely. Um... You know, the thing is, before the internet, I, I was on BBS, uh, bulletin board system. So for me, the first, I mean, and before that, I started programming when I was 11. So, so then I did mm. uh, like a course, a one year course. It was, I was the only children. Everybody else was like the, the following in age was, uh, following person in age was like 24 year old. So, so I was the only children in that course. And and, and you grew I, up in Buenos Aires or I grew else? up in Buenos Aires. I was mm. born and, and grew up in Buenos Aires. And I in Argentina. Mm -hmm. In Argentina, you know, most of my life, uh, I spent two years in a sailboat in, in South Beach and the, the Florida area and uh, Bahamas. But, but with the exception of those two years that I was living on the sailboat, every, all, all my life I've been in Buenos Aires. But also, I've been like, during the dot com era and the Bitcoin era, I was traveling, like you mentioned, like heavily all over the place. So, so I, I would say, you know, I visit great part of the world, but but my ha home was always in Buenos Aires. And so, so for me, it was a progression. It's like, you know, in the early 90s, I got into digital photography and, and 3D modeling. Then I, I jump into multimedia. So I was always fascinated about the, the human machine interaction. And then in 1994, uh, I met with some guys that were like building CD uh, ROMs. Like, you know, back then the CD ROMs, like, like the multimedia content was the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I already was engaging on, on BBS. I, wo I was running a node. So I was connecting through modems to people. We had this gigabyte uh bbs system where you had six modems they had mm. six modems so we were doing chats with and i was doing was my first connection through the computers with somebody i don't know a person from israel another person from uh, i don't know new zealand or and it was like that was wow like you know this what I'm year was this with the word this is like yes. when what year was this that was 1990 for 1990, yeah, 1994, 1990. Mm. And at the same time, I, I met with these guys that were doing like uh, multimedia for the main newspaper in Argentina. I showed them what I was doing. I was already doing some uh, um, kiosk with, with touch screens. Back then you had to like take, the touch screen was separate from the, the monitor. So you had to open the case of the monitor and, and, and basically glue the touch screen on top of the monitor then so that was the state of the art in in terms of interactions between human beings and, and machines like you know we had to build our touch screens back then so i showed them what i was doing and they told me you know what this newspaper is called clarin is the main newspaper in argentina back then it had a million subscribers on the week on the weekends um of physical newspapers being distributed mm. they they told me you know what uh, the newspaper is willing to build a, a media uh, area, like a digital media area within the, the mm. newspaper. If that happens, these were guys, uh, who, and if that happens, uh, we will call you because you, we want you to be part of this initial team that will bring digital media to this newspaper. And and that didn't happen that year. We like I, I met them at the end of 2013, but during 2000, uh, sorry, 1993. <laughs> and, and during that 1994, we, we kept like getting in touch and they introduced me to Wire Magazine, 
to the Media Lab, to Negroponte, to the Digital Divide. So we started discussing how the internet was going to change society as we knew it. And I was very young. I was like 19 years old. So I, I was searching for these things, but I was like, you know, for me, it was about ideology and social transformation. And in 1995, when they actually created the, the department within the newspaper, I was the third employee of that division. And, and we started also doing media uh, CDs and CD-ROMs for the newspaper, but they allowed us a, a great deal of freedom. So while we were doing that, I was studying HTML 1.0 by myself and uh, you know and, and experimenting with the web and then experimenting you had real audio that was the first uh, like audio streaming system so so we were experimenting with real audio and doing things and at the end of 1995 we came with a prototype and uh, of the newspaper and they told us you are crazy get out of here you're killing our business because how do you think we are going to distribute the content for free that's our business so forget about it but in March 1996, the, the main competitor launched its website. So they came to us and, and told us, you know, what do you want? We need to get out, uh, you know, we need to go live with, you know, tomorrow. So, so whatever you want, we will give it to you. So we started like, you know, saying, okay, now, now that you come back to us. And, and of course, as we were nerds, we still are in some, some way, but... <laughs> You know, what we asked was for computers. I had a Silicon Graphics that was the same computer that was used to Jurassic Park to actually write HTML pages and publish them. But, you know, the excuse was that the, the indie uh, from Silicon Graphics had the first what you see is what you get uh, editor for HTML, but, but truly it was not necessary. But, but, you know, it was like a very nice experience and they set up like a full office for us, 15... Uh, positions, uh, well, uh, 512k uh, direct connection, st stable connection to the internet, which back then was like amazing. And that's when I started like, and what I wanted from the internet, what my vision was the internet was going to enable the creation of communities around the globe of people who share interests, uh, regardless of where they were going, where they were living. No, so. So that I was very focused on this idea of using the internet to create communities with shared interests. So many of my efforts were in that direction. I, I created one um, related to the agricultural business, uh, another one related to the health uh, industry. I, I planned the seed for a community driven approach on Patagon that was one of the top financial startups uh, that a friend of mine, Wences, that today is, is in, in the crypto space from Sapo. So, so um, that was my vision was that it's like how we could use these tools to create communities and relate to each other in you know, uh, a peer to peer fashion and, and, and find people without boundaries that would share our interest in life. No? And, and also work together. I saw the, the tool as a social transformation tool as well. Okay, so then what happens after that uh, in terms of your story? Well, I after that, I, I leave the whole dot-com boom and bust. And now we're in what, in 90s still or? Yes, I, I, in, at the end of the 90s, in 1999, I, I, managed, I, I happened to be the, um, the research and development manager for one of the top portals in Latin America. I was very young, I was uh, 20, 24 at that moment. And, and I had like, you know, 20, 30 people, uh, you know, reporting to me and we were doing like a lot of things. Like we did a matchmaking uh, platform called Cupidonet. We did, I implemented the first uh, uh, ad servers, uh, called double, Dart, uh, Double Click, that later, now they are like the enterprise uh, solution of uh, Google Ads. Uh, I also implemented Inktomi, that was one of the first search engines. Akamai, that was one of the first distribution content networks. Uh, I, I created like a high, a high availability uh, environment where we had like you know, multiple front-end web servers. That was like very new for the moment because 
we, we were having like maybe 300,000 unique visitors per day. So it was like an amazing experience. And in 1999, we thought like that the, the, the web was going to grow forever. Like it was for us, for us, it was going to be like a permanent progression, you know, nonstop from the around 1 billion users we had that back then to, to the whole population. And then in the year 2000, everything collapsed, like the, the, the you know, the, the markets collapsed and everything. So I, I kept going because, you know, I was not there for the hype. I was there for the, so I, I keep working. I, I help an organization re, reshape itself uh, to focus on platforms for the education um, system. And, and we were doing like, um, management systems for the education first on the private sector and then we did a couple of projects with governments in in Dominican Republic uh, and in Ushuaia that is the the southest province in the world is in Tierra del Fuego is uh, is the southest province in the world Ushuaia is the capital so we were I was doing implementations of these systems with the idea that I would provide uh, you know resource planning uh, tools for the schools and then we would gather all that information on the ministry of education to do proactive planning of the growth of the educational system so we, i managed to get to that point with the project on dominican republic and we managed to onboard 200 schools and uh and then uh you know we had we ran out of money with the startup so you know, it got tougher and tougher. I was like, uh, you know, getting paid every six months. <laughs> like it was like, and, and it was like no money for six months and then paying debts altogether when I was getting paid. And it was very stressful. And then something in the relationship with my partners broke and, and, and then it didn't make sense for me, like uh, keep going in those, in those conditions. Um, and then I wanted to, to start fresh and, and start looking for other markets. So I decided the, the exchange rates in Argentina were very favorable to produce software in Argentina and sell it abroad. So I went to the US to, to understand if we could do startup there, I started doing networking. I wanted to live on a sale for my, my father took me on a sailboat when I was one month old. So. I had this idea that I wanted to live on a sailboat. So I found the opportunity to do both, like <laughs> start a new venture and live on a sailboat. Cool. Um, and, um, and then I realized I was burned out. Like when the mm. first projects arrived and, you know, I said, okay. And, and that was a signal for me. So I say, okay, I need to rest. I need to take care of my body, my mind. And then I was like two years kind of in a sabbatical. And this is in what, 2000s you said now? Or in like mid-2000s? It was 2003 to 2005. Mm -hmm. and, and when I felt recovered, you, know, uh, you know, I went back. And also I wanted to work on some inner things. Like uh, I wanted to work on my self-discipline, certain things that I, I, I felt were like stopping me from achieving my full potential. So I used that that time away from all my my known environment no from because in buenos aires i have a lot of connections i have my family so i have like a safety network that you know would help me so i wanted to be completely detached from any a, a, any support or like be by myself and working on myself and then on the things i wanted to build and i think i did i, I think it was very very good for my life in mm. that sense so i went back to buenos aires um, and started um, new projects, uh, a new project is software factory uh, with my ex-wife and, and, and other entrepreneurs. And I, I started building because I was already in this search for different ways of organizing uh, companies and, and human collectives. And so we were organizing it in a more cooperative way. And, and we were like trying to understand how that, that model would work, how to make it work uh, with proper economic incentives. That's why when, and, and I was doing that and, and mentoring entrepreneurs for during that process, which was one of the more uh, rewarding things during that process from 2005 
until 2015 when we decided to, well, I was well into Bitcoin and, and it was clear for me that my energy was going to be devoted there. So we decided to shut it down with the, with the co-founders. But um, in that process, for me, it was very good because I was still looking for something that would make me vibrate the same way that the, the web did back in the days. And these new entrepreneurs that started around 2009, 2010, that started with the mobile applications, with their kind of the rebirth of the, of the internet, they brought like new life to me in the sense that they, they made me reconnect with this uh, energy that I found in the creative energy that I found in the early days of the web. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I was in that process of mentoring some projects that were pretty successful uh, with young entrepreneurs. And, and then in 2011, I got in touch with Bitcoin, but I didn't get it. And in 2012, I reconnected and then I said, OK, I, I'm going, this is my new thing. I'm going to devote my life into it from now on. And, and that I did, you know, and that take us to, <laughs> to the present history, if you want. 2012, when was that around? Do you remember? It was early 2012. Um, early to, and when was that? Or I mean, it sounds like it was more like a decision point as opposed to, well, maybe a process as well. But uh, but was it like at a conference? Was it just like talking to some friends or your wife? Or Yeah, your it, it was actually Wences, my friend mm. from the from the web. Wences, day. yeah, yeah. Hey, just maybe just share quickly who Wences is because a lot of people might in India and Canada, I mean, I know in Bitcoin, most people know him, but, uh, but Wences yes. is... I, yeah. I mean, we met with Wences because in 1996, he was looking for, for funding. Mm. And one of the investors he went to told him, you know, I don't understand what you are talking about. Because back then, they were take, treating us as crazy people. You know? We were talking about the internet. People have had all these fantasies about the web. Like, uh, I don't know, there were robots doing things. And <laughs> <laughs> so so this investor told Wences, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but talk to Dieguito. I knew this investor because when I was very young, uh, one way of providing money for myself was like doing like installing computers and printers and things for people. And one of these people was this, the president of a big, one of the biggest producers in the world of lemons. So the, I mean, and, and we became friends. I was very young. I was like 17. He just moved in the position. He was 40. We started talking about Chinese philosophy, life in general, and we became friends. So like three years later, Wences comes to him and says, I, I'm looking for funding. He says to Wences, you know, I don't understand what you're saying. Talk to Dieguito, because he knew I was already webmaster of Clarín, the main new newspaper in Argentina. So I actually knew him by doing a due diligence on the ISP that Wences was running. And of course, it was awful. It was like a one 386 PC with uh, a mass of cables that was the, the, it was called Octopus. It was like a modem with eight ports. And that was the, the infrastructure of the ISP. <laughs> and I think that he had like 100 clients. No? But, but Wences always was very bright. He knew that he already, he already knew about his exit right then so he knew that his objective was to create to to build a user base because he knew this was going to be a business of the telcos and and of other players so so his objective was to early on build a, a sufficient um user base and then sell it to the telcos at a premium no so so he had that very clear i told I told what I saw to the investor the investor told when says you know what uh, I want to invest but you have to get rid of all the burden that you you have from the the startup of the project and when says he didn't want to do that because there were friends that invested he wanted to honor the the agreements he had so at the end he did the investor didn't invest but we became friends with Wences because you know back then Wences always joke about that uh, you he says, Diego, do you remember when you were bigger than me? Because <laughs> back then I had like a 512K direct connection, like a 15 uh, positions office for me. I was like managing that as webmaster during night. So, so Wences was coming to, to my office and, and he was like 
researching on the internet and we were exchanging ideas. So we were sharing, you know, because we, there was very few people who you could talk about the vision and what we, we wanted to do. So that's how we were, became friends. Then uh, the, the investors at Wences uh, found like disregarded him because he was very young. He was 22 back, back then and, and, and left him on the side, like put a, like a telco manager on top of the organization. And then Wences was very depressed. His girlfriend left him. And I told him, and, and well, over that year and a half where we, since we met, Wences was, Wences is very stubborn. Like he was telling me, you have to come work with me, work with me. And until I finally, finally, finally did, like in 1997, and then the new investors like left Wences out and his girlfriend left him. So Wences was completely depressed, <laughs> like with all this situation and told Wences, Wences, don't worry, we, we can build things. So let's just start something new. And that's when he started like looking for new models and we came out with, uh, he came out with this idea of, of building uh, E-Trade for emerging markets. And then I was telling him, oh, I love the idea. And also we need to build a community. Again, I was a little bit fixated with communities because then local traders can share information with the, with the people abroad. And we, you know, uh, people from the first world can trade on the on emerging markets. Uh, indeed, the other day, because I just moved houses, I found this, that is a, this is part of that area at the time, like you trade, they trade mouse pad. Um, so that's that's it, and that's when Wences started actually Patagon. That was one of the biggest uh, fintech. Well, back then we didn't have that were uh, projects in Latin America. He sold it to Santander for seven hundred and fifty million. Uh, a few years later, uh, in two thousand, in early two thousand. Um, so that's it. And Wences, in a way, you know, now he's the CEO of Sapo. He was one, if not the biggest institutional custodian of Bitcoin. And, and I think, you know, he is responsible for bringing mo most of the people in the, or the most relevant people in the Silicon Valley into Bitcoin in early 2012. And um, I've heard that. So, so that's a little bit of Wences and a little bit of That's our, crazy. And isn't he something for PayPal? Like some, I don't know, something. I think yes, he's Yes, the... because Wences since then, I mean, with Patagon, his idea that he didn't succeed, but his idea was to create a banking like a universal banking system that could service the whole latin america so he was always looking how to revolutionize payments and uh, finance so in that process then he went to the to the after that project failed and everything he started well he did a bank lemon bank then he did like um an electronic payment system, like an electronic device, he built it from scratch. He did the circuitry, everything. And then at the same time, the iPhone was released. So, so suddenly, like, you know, uh, his device was pointless because you had a better device with, with more advanced uh, features for, but, but he did that and, and his, uh, his way of thinking was, I want to digitize um, I want to digitize money and create an alternative system to that. So for him, Bitcoin was like an answer to something he was, in a way, we both were searching for something, a different thing, but both we were searching for something before we connected with Bitcoin. It's like a, Bitcoin was the answer to things that we were searching before. In his case, it was Bitcoin was the perfect solution for this backbone for the financial system he wanted to, to build. Uh, well, mobile devices solved that other pro problem he tried to, to, to solve. And indeed, he had this wallet at the end, the, the Lemon wallet that then changed name. Um, so he was always looking in, in that direction of disrupting uh, the financial model. He even went to the, to the point of creating a POS, a point of sale, a physical one, and tried to distribute it. He managed to do that in one city and with local banks uh, as in association with local banks he, he was like trying many many things iterating until he he got uh, into bitcoin and then devoted into this and he was director for paypal I, i'm not sure he still is but he was mm. a director for paypal so, 
So, so Diego, what, what was it about Bitcoin that, that really caught your attention? You know, uh, you, you did mention you, you from the from the get go that you were always searching for a more decentralization of power and that you felt was a solution. Um, but just curious, like, you know, what, what was it that really caught your attention? Because, you know, you'd seen everything by then. It seems like Internet and the newspaper <laughs> industry being disrupted. But, uh, but, but, but were there a few things that really kind of caught your imagination on this front? And Argentina that, as well. That, that's a very interesting lens, right? Coming from like everything yes. that's happened historically there with money. So yeah, but what, what, curious, what, what was like most resonated for you? The, the first thing that, I mean, my aha moment, because I got in touch with Bitcoin, as I said, in 2011, I, and I didn't get it. But in 2012, when Wences reached out to me, the aha moment was that we had capital controls in Argentina. So getting mm. money in and out, it was almost impossible. I had mm. my, my software factory and um, to give you an idea, I have customers in Europe and some customers in the US. And to get money from Europe or the US, and, and I, I was somebody with a lot of possibilities because I had like a US account, I had a European account. So I was not the norm you know, um, among Argentinians, but mm. even with those uh, capabilities, even being, uh, you know, lucky enough to have access to those things. And I was using also PayPal. So to get the money from my customers to Argentina was taking around a month with multiple hops of the different things and was costing me nine, 10% of the total amount. So that mm. was the amount of money and time that was being lost in the financial system. Mm. And when Wences reached out to me, like all psyched out about Bitcoin and told me, Dieguito, you have to see this, you know, this is amazing. This is, uh, you, know, <laughs> you have to check it out. And I say, oh yeah, well, I, I saw it last year, but yeah, let's, let's check it out sure. again. I mean, I'm always <laughs> open to new ideas. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so what he did was very practical. He told me, you know, open an account in blockchain.info. You know, I, I did. And uh, open an account there and give me the address. I gave him the address. And then he sent me 5,000 Bitcoins. So yeah. back, then, back then it was like 50K. It was not like what 5,000 Bitcoins are today, you know. And, but, but then I saw he 5,000 Bitcoins was $50,000 back then. And still it was a lot of money and and you know it was like uh, maybe a, s a small studio apartment in buenos aires like uh, you know um and then he told me well send it back i always <laughs> joke that i made the mistake of sending them back <laughs> but keep one he told me keep one and and i did it's like i keep one and the whole thing happened in an hour so that was like the first thing like i said wow you know that this is how an open financial system should work and, and, and how it should look. And, and that was like the first aha moment, like saying, okay. I mean, my first reaction was not connected to my search for a peer-to-peer -peer system. It was like more about like, okay, this is something awesome. It's something I never seen, seen before. Then like a lot of like, it, that's when you fall in the rabbit hole. No, a lot of other realizations came after like, Instead of having one full Bitcoin, I I had 0 0.9995. And then I realized there were transaction fees that I was paying to the network because I, I expected in traditional systems, the, the transactional costs are hidden. It's like somebody's paying them, but we don't know who. It's like, it's, it's, so suddenly I knew that I paid for the transaction fee. So this was a, like, there was no nobody like, uh, subsidizing the the operational cost, so so I paid for the fees. I I lost that Bitcoin playing uh, with Satoshi Dice. Of course, <laughs> so <laughs> I was playing with Satoshi Dice, and uh, <laughs> yeah. so it was like a very interesting thing. And with Wences, we do adventure trips. We cross the Atlantic. We have a group of friends with whom we do like uh, different adventures, adventure trips. And in two thousand. There are three, we, we had a bus, like an old bus, like um, uh, Mercedes-Benz 1114, that is like one, one with a very, you know, rounded uh, front, very beautiful thing. 
And we did, our objective with that bus was to go from Ushuaia, the southest city in the world, to Alaska. So that we wanted to connect the two places in trenches, no? So, and the thing is we did the first part, we went from Buenos Aires to Ushuaia, then back to Buenos Aires, we were doing repairs. repairs and when we did the technical verification, somebody uh, to, you know, uh, gave us away and, and they stole our bus. So from 2003 until 2012, we were without the bus and that project got stopped. So in 2012, the other thing that started to happen is like, we decided we wanted to buy a new bus to restart our process of going from Ushuaia to Alaska. And the first use case I had- Diego, I, I, I kind of missed that. Why were you doing this? Why were you driving from the Southern, just to show that it's possible or just to, for fun or? Uh, just for the experience because- Oh, cool, okay. <laughs> and wait, it is possible you're, we, and you can drive from like there to there? Like, there, it, like there's like land in between or you don't need to- There, there, is, a, there is a very tough place that is the Darien Strait uh, in Panama. That is like, is the, where, where you have to go by water. Indeed, to go from the southern southern tip to to Argentina to the Tierra del Fuego island, you need to take a barge. Indeed, we did that. We put the bus on a barge and we gotcha. cross it through the Strait of Magallan, Magellan Strait. Okay, yeah. Continue with your story. So I, I kind of yeah. lost. <laughs> why, why are we doing this? Okay, just to show. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, continue. no, just because we like. Uh, the adventure we like to share that's what we share among friends and uh, cool. you know back then in the first trip we did 21 days but now we are older we have a lot of responsibilities so we are doing it like uh, one week per year or something like that but in 2012 we decided to re regain so the other use case I, the first use case i had for bitcoin was actually wences was sending bitcoins to me and i was sitting in cafes and to another friend of my of us and we were sitting in cafes, like selling the bitcoins to get the money we needed to repair, to buy the bus first and to repair the bus afterwards. So that was another use case, um, one of the early. And that was how I started, like also to get to know who was involved. Because in, in, in the early days of Bitcoin in 2011 in Argentina, for example, the, the ones involved were gamers because the kids were, they had 3D uh 3d gaming computers that have gpus so they were most of the gamers were i mean most of the miners were gamers back then so many of my interactions like selling bitcoin they were more selling than buying but most of the, the interactions later on buying bitcoins were from gamers i even bought some so i that's kind of how the thing started is like that was the genesis so i as i said you know this initial aha moment with wences then I was like 15 days non-sleeping, reading about it. Uh, so so the, the further realization was this non-intermediation. Then the other thing, and, and those 15 days right after this experience with Wences were mostly about understanding the financial system of the world. So I, I mostly read about the, the history of money, uh, Bretton Woods, uh, fractional reserve because I I came from a financial uh, from a technical background so I was missing indeed I subscribed to Investopedia and I was getting one financial term every day from that point for two three years until I I felt I understood the financial system enough to to be able to so so for me that was like and and at the end of those fifteen days I get to the article from Eric Boris. Uh, that is something like a libertarian view on Bitcoin. And, uh, and his article, like, I don't know why, because I, I read it afterwards and I, it doesn't say anything about this in particular, but, but that article like triggered in me, okay, this is the solution I was looking for to create systems like truly peer to peer systems where, uh, you know, now I can express it differently, but where, accumulation of power could not be enforced uh, by using the force. No, the, the, you have this concept of, you know, the problem is power accumulation is not a problem, it's part of human nature. We always tend to delegate some part of our power in others. The, the problem is when those depositors of our power uh, don't um, fulfill, you know, they, 
they don't procreate on the trust we are delegating in them and change the rules to stay in power or, or to so so when when power relationships freeze is the main problem so that was what i was looking uh, and uh, for like a solution foucault spe stop, talks about this no the power the freezing of or crystallization of power relationships so i was looking for ways to have these dynamic power relationships where you know money could flow money can accumulate or value can flow can accumulate but if i don't fulfill the expectatives of others or i don't create value for others i cannot change the rule to regain the power i lost or to stay in power regardless of the my value contribution to society so that was exactly what what said okay this that was the moment when i said okay i want to devote my life to bitcoin and and it was more of an intuition because of course now we have the tools to do what I wanted and, and it's more clear what's the path forward. But back then it was more of an intuition than, than a reality in the, in the Bitcoin space. I think I remember that article you're talking about too, uh, because, you know, Eric, Eric was back in those days, uh, Diego, there weren't that many people making YouTube video. I remember there was like maybe 10 people or something that you could count on. Like, yeah, on it was my, <laughs> Eric Roger was also very vocal. We, we used to call him Bitcoin Jesus because of that, because of all I the, remember that. I remember that. The work. And there was a show. I don't know if you remember. There was like a guy, I forget his name, but he used to interview people. And there was only literally just like one show. I forget his Anyways, it, it, anyway, so, um, but okay. So, so what happens then? Uh, so once you, so you're, you're captivated by Bitcoin now, you're thinking, okay, well, I want to devote my life to it, but how do you... Yeah, how do you do that? How do you approach it? And that, and by the way, that is kind of the essence of why I'm doing this show to some extent in the sense that I want to encourage other people to, um, you know, build on Bitcoin, right? It's not just about like, oh, you know, number go up uh, or just get rich <laughs> type of deal. It's like, uh, I mean, I definitely, I agree with you. I think I see, you know, I see like a, an asymmetric opportunity here to, to change the world for good, uh, for the, for the better rather. And um, so, yeah, so we're curious. So how do you, but how do you kind of like take those next steps, you know, in terms of like, uh... well, first things I, I, the first things I did is like, I knew from the web days, two things. You know, it's like, and, and we discuss these things with Wences as well, no, I, or three things if you want. But, you know, one thing is like, that I knew from myself is like, with disruptive technologies, it's impossible to understand how they will develop. So the only way to understand them is by doing things with it. So if you, if you do things with uh, disruptive technologies, th then through that process, you learn and understand the, the deep implications of it. So. So I said, I need to start doing everything possible with this technology. Mm. So that was one thing I knew. Um, the other thing I knew was um, that evangelizing, although I've been a, a, lot, a big evangelizer, but, but uh, you know, advocacy or evangelization don't uh, create like, you know, the, the true contagion effect comes from use cases that serve people. So we needed to find use cases that were like meaningful for people and would improve their life because that speaks, you know, thousand times more than the explanation of the or the ideological elements behind them. No? So be, because I leave that in the web day. So, so, you know, I was explaining the web for three, four years, maybe 1996, 1995 to 1998 with very little impact. And then suddenly you had Hotmail and everybody understood. So you didn't, you didn't have to explain too much. It's like, it was something that allowed people to connect with their families, their friends across the world. That's it. So, so we need to find like use cases that were meaningful for, for people. And the third thing I knew it was going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And I've been saying this since 2013, like because I was prepared for that. Is and this is what we were discussing with Wences, that we saw the potential of the web. We were there. We were helping. We were an important, relevant part, not the most important, but a relevant part of the web days. And we, in a way, lost because at the same time I want to live on a sailboat. Wences also was like living around the, the world with a sailboat. So mm. 
in a way we lost faith mm. you know in in our belief of what the web was going to become and we mm. we lo- we put our focus somewhere else and and some people and it's not that i'm comparing with him no but some people like jeff bezos went through a process of like being three thousand million dollars in the red and and he kept going and keep doing keep building and like he never lost faith in 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 his view so we we in a way promised each other that we were not going to stop until we were going to see this go through the process of like the common the ups and downs of this process and achieve the vision no so that those were the three things i started which is it's very it's a lot when you are starting a new movement and in new innovation disruption cycle so so with those three things i said okay i will start doing whatever i can around this so i bought a, a mining machine started mining i i tried to buy some butterfly miners some of the first a6 that i remember they, yeah they never deliver no um, oh no <laughs> I mean, they deliver to some people, but not to others. Okay, uh, okay. Um, I, I then went says at the end of 2012, created the first meetup in Buenos Aires. Um, I was I was not there, but but uh, my other partners in the in the Latin American Bitcoin NGO did did attend Rodolfo and Franco. Um, I started buying and selling bitcoins. Like to get to know who was involved. As that's how I met the gamers. Um, some very interesting people. For example, a guy that uh, didn't have retirement uh, funds because his employer never contributed. So he only had saved like 25k, and he decided to buy Bitcoin and gold as a retirement uh, program. So so I knew a lot of very interesting people in those cafe meetings and. Uh, and and then in 2013, uh, at the beginning of 2013, I told Wences, you know, I would love to be administrator of the meetup because I want to continue with with, with this meetup that you started. And at the same time, Rodolfo and Franco also uh, reach out to, I think not Franco, but Rodolfo reach out to him, and we made the first meetup together. Uh, it was a 25 people meetup, and that's when the community we clicked the three of us like Rodolfo like came to me because I had a closer relationship with Wences like saying you know I want to build the community as well so I told him yeah of course let's join <laughs> forces and build the community together and that's when we started and and from the beginning we were meeting in a McDonald's with them and from the beginning in in we were like discussing I was telling them you know I think Bitcoin is is the tool that can transform Latin America. It can turn Latin America, you know, take it out, like leapfrog Latin America in, into the future financial system instead of going through a progressive process and also solve many of the problems, the corruption, the inequality that Latin America has. So, so and, and the funny thing is like, we were three guys on a McDonald's, uh, you know, that was our office. And, and instead of saying you are crazy or megalona, megalomaniac, they, they told me, no, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's build it. And that's how, you know, Rodolfo proposed to do the Latin American Bitcoin conference that we did, La Bitconf, um, in December 2013. I created the first payment processor system called RestoCoins with my, my software development company. Uh, in, and also I created a, a system called Mercado Bitcoin. So you could see the price of Bitcoin in, in pesos because as we had like an official dollar rate and an informal dollar rate, when people was coming from abroad, sometimes people was cheating on them and paying them the official rate that was lower than the, than, than the uh, black market uh, rate for Bitcoin. So I did the, I, I com, you know, several tools to actually have experience, an experience using Bitcoin in Argentina. And, and I mean, to pause it or do you have something to do? Or? It was a bus. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'll pause it. So yeah. Oh no, we're good. We're good. Okay. Continue, continue. Go ahead. Diego. Yes. And, um, so I, I did that and, um, also, um, 
you know, I convinced a couple of restaurants to accept Bitcoin. So, mm. so we started like doing that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, having experiences, doing meetups. We started monthly meetups, then bi-monthly meetups. And the community kept growing. The second meetup we had, we had a hundred people because then, you know, Argentina, like the media started talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin went from 20 to 260 in, in March, April. So all the excitement around that. Um, I started like going to Chile to start the first meetups in, in Santiago. Uh, the same in, in, in Montevideo, in Uruguay. Uh, I started opening the meetup platforms for Colombia, Mexico, different, different countries in in the region and, and searching for leaders. And at the end of 2013, many of us joined together at La Bitconf and, and that was kind of the, the initial, the initial uh, beginning of the, the Latin American Bitcoin uh, community. I, I need to cut yeah, one second. Yeah, let me pause it. it. Ooh, one, okay, so we're back, Diego. Uh, okay, so continue, so I guess, um, you know, we were just kind of talking offline about how, you know, I think uh, to be in this industry, it's you got to be a little, uh, a little bit different. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And, uh, and so, so, you know, again, like I was telling you, um, is it one of my goals is to demystify how people somehow go from, you know, curiosity to eventually, you know, like being able to like, you're a normal guy, you live in the, you know, you have family, you have responsibilities, but somehow we're, we're, you know, we're, we're full time in this space and we, we somehow, I'd say double full time sometimes, but, uh, but, uh, but curious, like, how did you finally kind of pave your path into this space uh, and what opportunity did you guys see? Well, you know, at the end of 2013, around uh -huh. the Bitcoin, mm -hmm. I was questioning myself. I had like a lot of experience, like doing this payment processor, the, the, the price uh, platform. So you know, tourists wouldn't be ripped off when they came to, to change Bitcoins in Argentina. La Bitcoin, the meetups, the community was growing. We had like top meetup with 150 people. And during this whole process, I was like looking for my place of application, no? So, so I was looking like saying, okay, where, where I want to apply my energy. And then I, I decided I wanted to, to focus on democratizing access to finance and, and on financial inclusion. So that was my, my decision. And back then it was only Bitcoin where there were some other projects being born, but, but it was mostly Bitcoin. There, there was no blockchain back then. So, so I, in, in that sense, I was like, um, I started that path and um, at the end of 2013, I started a company called Coibanks with the objective of creating these financial platforms. I was acknowledging that back then the technology was not ready and maybe, you know, with Coibanks, we were trying to also like create a, a way for traditional investors and, and people to get into the crypto space. And then as part of that process, like pitch them and build a relationship where we could tell them about the potential of this technology for the future. Indeed, that was kind of the of the confrontation with my partners because they were saying, you know, we, you are spending like one hour explaining why Bitcoin is relevant for society and and fifteen minutes, you know, selling the the services. But but it was for me, it was like what we could do in that in that moment, and also at the same time, I was like doing with the NGO some uh, experiments of bringing people from the slums to the meetups and, and um, with another group of people that volunteers, we were like exploring how to get Bitcoin to the people like uh, in, um, you know, in a cool way. And as for those experiences, I realized two things. I realized one thing that Bitcoin alone was not enough from a technology perspective, because the, even for the financial platforms, you know, we I had to rely on centralized business logic or agreement settlement. Uh, so that would defeat in a way the purpose. I would have like a decentralized censorship resistant store of value and transfer of value system, but 
if the business logic was going to be centralized, then we were back to, to zero. On the other side, on, on my work on the slums, we were identifying something that we refined later on in 2015, 2016, that we realized that people who live day by day, week by week, um, cannot afford to wait for Bitcoin volatility to come back. It's like, you know, if you, if you are short term, you need stable assets. And also part of that process is, was realizing that the, um, for people, it was too leap of faith because you were, we were asking people to digitalize money. This is cash economies. It's like on the slums, people is cash economy in full. No digital, no banking economy. Now it has changed a little bit, but it was full cash. So we were asking people to digitalize money and then to use a new type of currency. So we needed to explain a lot of things to them. So we needed a bridge. So we needed a, um, you know, a representation of the local currency. And I didn't want to rely on third parties. So I started to think about this idea of a peer-to-peer -peer monetary system backed by Bitcoin. So going back to the gold standard, uh, but with Bitcoin. So th those were like defining the experiences that we were, we approached like big development banks back then, the Benedes from Brazil, uh, we did uh, like um, an East, uh, a Latin American Bitcoin conference for institutions as well to spread the word among like big institutions and banks. So we were like trying to understand like touch base with multiple actors to understand how to bring this into, into the mix. And at the end of 2014, I was doing a fundraising for Coibanks and, uh, and a friend of mine like set me, set me up because he told me, eh, let's meet in Palo Alto to drink something. And I went with my partner with Gabriel uh, that is also part of RSK, um, co-founder of RSK. And, you know, we went there, I started, um, you know, talking with him and about Bitcoin. He's, like a, an old time Bitcoiner from the early days. Um, so we started talking about this and he said in a point he told me, well, uh, I need to introduce you to somebody. And he went around the corner and came back with Nick Savo. And that's it. Cool. I mean, that, that was like, <laughs> so, so actually he wanted me to meet with Nick and Nick was interested to understand what I was doing in Latin America with Bitcoin. So he wanted to understand what was going on with with Bitcoin in Latin America. So we started, I started sharing about the community creation, the different things we were doing. And then I, of course, I was sharing what I wanted to do. That was like, a, you know, an inclusive financial system using Bitcoin and all these shortcomings. And I knew about um, Ethereum already because in January, 2014, um, you know, um, Vitalik, in the North American Bitcoin conference that was the, the first one, or I think it was the first one um, or the second one. I think maybe Mo did another one before. So in that conference, uh, Vitalik announced, and I recall it was very funny because it was Vitalik and then a lot of people like uh, walking back <laughs> on his back, like following him, like a, kind of a messiahs. So he announced the idea of Ethereum. And from my perspective, for my purpose is like, you know, building a, a network from a scratch and building the network effects and the liquidity and the acceptance that Bitcoin had created was going to take a long, long time. So, so in my point of view, it was not a philosophical thing. It was more of a pragmatic thing. You know, disregarding all the things that Bitcoin had achieved wouldn't be the fastest path to have you know, uh, an inclusive financial system. And, and the other thing is that I knew because the world, the world bank was doing some analysis that they were projecting that by 2020, half of the unbanked population would have a smartphone in their hands, which actually happened. No, now we know that that's a reality. So my expectation was like, you know, and that's what I told Nick, I think if we can, and, and my focus was mostly on the peer to peer monetary system, but I told Nick, you know, I think we have an opportunity if, if we extend Bitcoin to create this peer-to-peer -peer monetary system and have like basic rules of engagement 
um, you know, we can we have the opportunity in, in five years from now to have a system ready that will serve those uh, excluded from the financial system uh, and, and do it that in a private conscious and protecting way because you know the digitalization of money is happening anyways and and back then ecuador started doing digitalization of money and and attacking bitcoin so i i saw that confrontation i said okay this is going in a way where there will be a fight for who digitalize money and and if we do it on the right platforms then we will protect people's privacy if the wrong platforms win then we'll have a big brother system where we all of us will be monitored so so there was many concerns there. And then um, Nick has met with Sergio Lerner early on in Princeton in 2014. And I was, uh, I, and Sergio was one of our speakers in La Bitconf where he, in 2013, where he shared the Patoshi, the probable Satoshi pattern with the million. So, so Sergio came out in the conversation and then my friend sent an email, you know, uh, to, to Sergio saying, you know, we were discussing this with Nick and Dieguito. Uh, if you want to, if, if you want to do this, if you want to really like bring uh, smart contract capabilities to to Bitcoin, uh, we we will support you because Sergio already was the first one to create a, a Turing complete cryptocurrency in 2013, in May 2013, called Quixcoin. And, and then Sergio was working on an evolution of that project called Nimblecoin. Um, so that was it. Then in December 2014, we touched base with Sergio at La Bitconf in Brazil. I shared with him my, my view on the, this P2P monetary system. He told me, I think it's the same effort to do this specific use case or build like a, a Turing complete. Uh, general purpose solution. Uh, then we lost touch because both of us were doing our stuff. And then uh, some months later, they came to me because uh, Sergio has his partners that are the other co-founders of RSK with whom he was working on Nimblecoin. And, and they had this problem of how to, to create like adoption or growth the user way. So given my, my place in the community, in the Bitcoin community, they wanted me to help them find out how to, how to solve this. And then we started having like, I was going there just for help, you no? Know? Like to, to have like, we were having some meetings, drinking cafes and, and discussing about different adoption strategies and thing. And at the end of 2015, we, you know, Sergio released the, the white paper for, for Rootstock based on, on you know, uh, also, uh, you know, the Blockstream released the sidechain paper at the end of 2014. So Sergio took all his ideas plus the sidechain, <laughs> released the white paper. Uh, Sergio sent it to Nick because of our previous conversations. Nick got all excited about it and tweeted about that saying like rootstock is the best of ethereum and bitcoin combined and then something that was only like cafe conversations and an idea like suddenly we said okay if we don't do it somebody will do it so we need to move forward and find fun funding for this and and start you know building seriously about this project so that's uh, how at the end of 2015 we formalized our our relationship and uh, in January 2016 we found we, we got the first funding round of one million dollars and with that we we released the, the testnet the alpha version of rootstock um, and then at the end of 2000 and uh, the beginning of uh, 2017 the beta version and at the same time we we did our first uh, round of funding of 3.5 million and with that we released the productive version of RSK that Rootstock RSK started in January 2018 on the birthday of Bitcoin um, and and started with 5% of the hashing power of Bitcoin and well now we have it I'm over time it became to be what it is today it has 60% of the hashing power of Bitcoin protecting both Bitcoin and RSK. Um, so that was like 
if you want the beginning of, of Rootstock, but I was always chasing this vision of the internet of value, you know, that I started sharing at the end of 2015, uh, this layer approach of ex extending Bitcoin. Uh, so I knew that on top of agreement settlement, that is what RSK provides to Bitcoin, we needed to have other peer-to-peer -peer protocols to have a truly peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. So we needed storage, data storage, we needed uh, off-chain payment systems that now we have a more clear view of the full architecture because now on top of payment channels, we have commit chains and other things that supplement this original idea of off-chain payment systems, uh, secure communications, identity systems, reputational based identities, because that's part of my, my thesis for financial inclusion is that one of the reasons why people is excluded is because they don't have a collateral. They don't have something of value to put as collateral to interact with uh, financial services. But what everybody has, any human being, regardless of their economic condition has, is a reputation. So if we could create that reputation in a reliable way, build up that reputation from the interactions, social and financial interactions of a human being, then we can provide any human being in the planet with a collateral to act with financial services or with others to associate with other people and use that as a trust and as a valuable asset, no? Because if you betray that trust, then your whole reputation is tainted. And if your whole reputation is tainted, then you have to rebuild the reputation from scratch. And that takes time and life and, and behavior, no? And behavior. So, so that is the thesis. So, that's when at the end of 2018, we, re we launched the RSK infrastructure services called RIF. That is this set of peer-to-peer -peer protocols that use the settlement the agreement settlement layer as a dispute resolution system, but that function in a purely peer-to-peer -peer manner to complete the picture of all the infrastructure needed for this financial inclusion system. So um, that's a little bit I know, I think it summarizes the <laughs> kind of the full evolution. At the end of 2019, we also bought Laringa, a social network, the more famous social network in Latin America or in the Spanish speaking part of Latin America, uh, with the and purpose of integrating okay. these models. No? So. What? Okay, good. Okay, with the, sorry. Yeah, continue, continue. <laughs> so fascinating, man. It's crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay, continue. But okay, I have a couple of th uh, points I wanted to make uh, real quick. So yes. it's important to note that two things that Nick Zabo's name is in the Bitcoin white paper as a reference. Am I mistaking? Or he's like something no. to do with smart contracts or he's like, the yeah, I mean, he was what, the what's first kind of one his to... claim to fame. I mean, I know I follow him and I know he's well kind of respected within the Bitcoin community, but what's his main thing? Well, he, he was the first one to coin the concept of a smart contract back in 1992. 1992 if i don't i mean i don't recall if it was 1993 1990 yeah 1993 interesting okay so and and also if you look he has a blog called an, an enumerated um he was also involved in the first versions of digital uh, digital money like censorship or it was intended to be like censorship uh, like digital gold e-gold and different projects that you know were shut down so He's one of the pioneers, I would say, of um, both the smart contracts, but also digital money. Uh, Was know, his he, work referenced in the Bitcoin white paper? I, I, I'm not sure he's referenced on the white oh, paper. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't no, know. No, because sure I think mm -hmm. the only ones referenced there, Alan Bag is referenced there because of hash cash. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think he has a reference. And then the guys who did this blockchain thing on the newspaper, do you know the... Stornetti uh, is also reference. Mm, uh, interesting. Uh, okay, so it was a smart contract thing that that I remember was was very notable. So and and, and I mean, many was, speculate that he Satoshi, no, but <laughs> and doesn't he have a blog so post called yeah. Bitcoin or something? Hey, uh, oh, I think I lost him. He definitely. Hey, Rodolfo, are you? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Diego, are you back? Hello, Am I Diego. Back? Uh, you're, you're kind of cutting up here. Let's give it a few seconds. Uh, I'll pause it again. Okay. Are we good now? Okay. I think we're back. Okay, cool. Sorry. What were you saying there near the end? Diego, you said something. No. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, no, I mean, 
many things because of his contributions that he is right. part of the of right. the collective. Yeah, some yeah, yeah. Have done analysis of his writing versus the white paper writing. So they they say that his writing is very similar in some ways to the. To so the did, did, did he not have a blog post called Bitcoin or something? This with separate words, or I thought, or digital, yeah, or some, something, some, like yeah, that. something yeah. like that, right? I mean, I don't know, I forget what it was. Okay, um, the other thing you got wanted to mention is is that or bring up rather is is that, um, did did you, did you expect Ethereum to kind of I guess see the type of uh traction that it has and i mean what does that mean, I mean well okay let me let me let me distill the question out a little bit more um vitalik clearly thought that what he wanted to do wasn't going to be possible on bitcoin right i mean he felt that bitcoin developers didn't want whether it be like whatever bloating and this and that and he just felt like this idea of a truly decentralized world computer if you will would not be possible on Bitcoin, right? That that's kind of that was his thesis, and he said, "I'm going to go my own way." You guys looked past some of that and said, "No, it is possible with some maybe short-term costs, uh, but long-term, we think we can maybe get there." So, just curious, like, can you talk a little bit more about? I don't know, Ethereum kind of. And the, yeah, I, I like think, like yeah, how that experience I didn't expect played it, out. Mm. Yeah, as I said, I didn't expect it, Ethereum to go so far so fast. Mm. I think they did an amazing job. Um, I mean, they are facing the consequences of being first movers and, and, you know, the bottlenecks they have, some points of, they did some sacrifices for the sake of a speed, um, you know, like, like some point of centralization, they, they accepted like the Infura services, things that can be avoided with like clients and other infrastructure that, that remains more peer to peer or distributed. Um, but all in all, what I, the only thing I have for Vitalik and, and the Ethereum community is respect because they have contributed heavily to building primitives, financial primitives and things that are, will be very, very useful for society in the long term. So, and I understand Vitalik's frustration because it's like, you know, he wanted to, to build something new. He wanted, he first approached the Bitcoin community to do what he wanted to do. And you know, the Bitcoin is is like um, I don't know. It, it, crystallization of the protocol is part of its nature. It's like I, 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 I it took me until this the Segwit to uh, to X dispute. I didn't understood well that you know crystallization of the protocol is part of is a feature. It's part of the evolutionary process of of a protocol that has security at, at, at its core. And, you know, I, I was having conversations with Nick saying, well, because I had these, some ideas about how to get consensus on hard forks, or at least not consensus, but signaling on how to implement hard forks in a more, in, le, in a less disruptive way. And, and his answer was like, kind of, he was very succinct. So I will make up some, my interpretation of what he said, not what he said exactly, but conceptually, like his answer was like, I mean, this, the protocol is good as it is. It's like, you know, and then it may, okay. If it's good as it is, it's like, okay. It means that, you know, Bitcoin has this kind of evolutionary approach. It's like, anybody can copy it. Anybody can set up a, a network. Of course, building network effects takes time, take, takes effort and everything, but everybody can try new models based on Bitcoin. And, and at the end, it's a market decision, which protocols survive and which ones die. No, it's, it's like, that's how is the process is instead of like a democratic approach where, you know, the majority or beats the minority here is like, if you are a minority, go for it. Like, test your model, you know, and you're not oppressed by the majority. Test your model, if it works and the market responds to it, your minority system will become the majority system and it's more evolutionary, more Darwinistic in a way. So then I realized that, you know, but, but back then we are talking 2014, I understand, like Vitaly wanted to innovate, wanted to bring new functionalities to Bitcoin and the, 
<laughs> and the answer was like, get out of here. You know, we are not going because indeed some opcodes from some functionalities from from Bitcoin were like shut down and and re, re, cut. No, in early year. So the the process of Bitcoin was more in the in the way of like ossification more than in the way of opening up. And and in RSK we face the same problems because we we had to take some compromises to to extend bitcoin capabilities knowing that in the first years there was no way no way to actually create like a trustless uh, peg between bitcoin and and rsk so sergio's model for for creating sidechain had that into account so it started with the federation then uh, added the the miners the, the what we call the hybrid peg um into the mix and and what we have been doing through the years is like on one side you know making the peg notorious the one signing the transactions on the peg less uh, you know removing subjective involvement from them to the point we are now where they can only unplug the devices they cannot actually steal the funds or or sign um or or sign um you know, random transactions. They they only can sign transactions that have been approved approved on RSK by the hashing power of the Bitcoin network. So we had like restricted the activities that pegnatories can do to a minimum. Then we are in the process of having a fallback federation. So even if those pegnatories are compromised and removing off devices, they cannot uh, stall the peg. So they cannot. Uh, you know, leave the funds locked. So that's another aspect. And we are working already on the final version of the original white paper idea that was this hybrid peg. With that, you will get, you know, as far as you can get in terms of decentralization and trust minimization without changing Bitcoin, without adding a new opcode to Bitcoin. So that was our approach. It was saying, you know, what we need to do is take, I mean, take the, all the tools that we have at hand and, uh, you know, put them to create the trustless possible peg to Bitcoin. Uh, create enough value for the Bitcoin ecosystem. So full alignment with the Bitcoin economy was crucial. That's why we decided that our native currency was going to be Bitcoin, not issue a new currency, because that was a key element in this. Is like all the things that happen in RSK you know, create value for the Bitcoin ecosystem, for the Bitcoin miners, for the security infrastructure. So RSK is in full alignment. It's really a layer two to Bitcoin because it's in full alignment from the economic incentives with the Bitcoin network and the interest of Bitcoin. Um, and do that until Bitcoin was ready to, to do some modifications that would enable RSK to be fully trustless, which is possible, but requires, uh, you know, these, these opcodes. And we have been working also on the research of that. So like, what would be like a trustless way? And we are doing a trustless peg with Ethereum, for example. So in between RSK and Ethereum, it's possible to have a trustless peg. So we have been advancing the technology. Indeed, we took the flight client concept from Ethereum and we improved it. Sergio found some uh, vulnerabilities, some exposures and, and create what we define as the hawk client instead of the flight client that it improves on those things. So. We are doing the research to get to that point to, to leave all the research and the code base ready for when the Bitcoin core developers think that is the time is right for that. Having said that, today you have an Ethereum protocols that are handling uh, with a regular multi-sig, nothing close to the security of RSK, are handling tens of thousands of Bitcoins. So I think we can do like create like a very, very interesting share economy between RSK and Bitcoin without the need of this fully trustless model. But of course, once we have this trustless model, then RSK and Bitcoin will become one. There's no difference in terms of like... Uh, the that, 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 that opcode, Diego, um, what's the main argument against it? Is it like, does, like the way you're proposing it with the layer two, does it actually, you know, fill up blocks and cause all this? No, right? Because that's kind of the idea behind it. Like, what what would be the main argument? Like, what, what would let's say the people who are against? No, that everything. Making, you know, mm, yeah, sorry, go I ahead. Go ahead. The, the main 
Yeah, the main problem with adding opcodes to Bitcoin is that it open that that expands the surface of attack of Bitcoin. No, so you know that's it needs to be something really meaningful. That's why what we want is to to make RSK so meaningful that it's really something that Bitcoiners see as something valuable for the Bitcoin ecosystem and for the survival of Bitcoin because RSK actually it's important for the survival of Bitcoin because RSK is the first blockchain that doesn't have minting or subsidy, uh, you know, um, by issuance. We, we don't, as we don't have minting of new coins, we are testing how Bitcoin will behave eight years from now when, when the new minting won't, won't be relevant and Bitcoin will have to survive out of fees only. So, I mean, that's that's one of the threats that Bitcoin has. Is like in the future, Bitcoin is going to need to survive from fees alone by adding a secondary network with other functionalities, but that gives revenue to the same operators of the same in physical infrastructure. What we are providing the Bitcoin miners is with additional revenue streams mm. from doing securing other types of agreement. In this case, smart contracts, other types of uh, operations. And we are also securing the long term of Bitcoin, not only is, is because it's like, otherwise the transaction fees on Bitcoins need to go to a place that might, might render Bitcoin unusable for many use cases, which I think it will still go. And, and we discuss this is like, if you want maximum security, which is what Bitcoin is designed for, it's okay to pay more, <laughs> you know, for a transaction, but, it, but ideally you want to have a second Dari, an intermediate security layer on top that enables you to move Bitcoin at a you know less a lesser security model, but a lower transaction fees, which is RSK, and then on top of that have two peer to peer protocols that will enable you to go even further and sacrifice security or decentralization for the sake of even lowering more the transaction. But but I think this layer approach also enables you to do that to do that. So. I would say, yeah, I think, for, and, and to, from a technical perspective, the thing is Bitcoin only collects fees or, or values transactions based on, on, uh, on the size they have, on the, on the size they occupy on the blockchain, no? So, because it's all about the bytes that you are consuming to, for a transaction. So if you think about it, it's like the economical model of Bitcoin is around usage of a storage on the network, but it doesn't penalize, for example, the usage of CPU or memory. So, so if you have opcodes that have a long, you know, a lot of uh, CPU usage or memory usage, you can use those as an attack to Bitcoin. And indeed, you know, uh, Sergio identified one of these problems that is the quadratic bug. And, uh, and, and you know, that was solved with SegWit, but, there were some attacks that were around that. It's like abusing the, you know, uh, um, transactions, uh, transaction structures to basically cre create uh, long time uh, validation processes that would take more than the 10 minute uh, time frame that you have be between blocks, no? So I think the only thing we need to be aware is like whatever we do add as an opcode to Bitcoin doesn't have these vectors of attack, but Sergio is, is very conscious about that. So whatever comes from us will fulfill these these things. No, and, and we are ex, ex, you know working on some ideas around zero knowledge proof, uh, succinct zero knowledge proof that are very small in size, so they won't impact the bloat on the blockchain. But okay, there's this trade-off of CPU usage versus storage. So those are the things, the considerations. But this is it can be. It can be done, but but it's a process because also the zero knowledge proof technology is evolving a lot and has evolved a lot in the last, you know, uh, four or five years. So 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 I think it's a process. I think we will get there, hopefully hey, hey, five hey, years hey, from now. Hey Diego, um, I'm just wondering. So I did see something called Unis, like a Uniswap fork of uh of on the RSK, the RSK network. swap, yeah. <laughs> RSK swap, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Um. I was going to say, has anyone done like an integrated exchange where you have like the ability to do both Ethereum assets yes. and, uh, you know, let's say Bitcoin assets? Two, two projects. I mean, the, the RSK swap is a peer-to-peer -peer 
and, and I will say this, this is one of the few protocols that is mm. really DeFi in Ethereum, the Uniswap is because it's, it's truly peer to peer protocol. It's an exchange protocol. So we have that in RSK, the RSK swap, which I like a lot because it's, you know, people talk about DeFi on Ethereum, but most of the DeFi protocols are not D, de, no, they are not decentralized. They, they rely on third parties for Oracle. I mean, they rely for data sources, for example, they, they all have Oracle. So I think it's a misnomer talking about DeFi, which is okay. I think decentralization is, is, is like an aspiration. It's not a fixed goal. It's like you are always decentralizing things more and more and more. That happened with Bitcoin. Bitcoin started with one developer and one miner. So <laughs> look all the, all the way it went. So that's okay. But I think the important thing is that we are honest with people and users so they know which, which, um, which, I mean, which risk they are, you know, being exposed to. Um, so Uniswap is the first one. And then the money on chain protocol that actually they build the first Bitcoin back stable asset. That is the, the money on chain protocol. The dollar on chain is, is the asset. It's very nice protocol because it doesn't depend on market makings or liquidity. It's also like a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, but it, it requires Oracle. So it has that point of centralization, but on the operation of the exchange in the Bitcoins, four dollars on chain, you don't need intermediaries. So that's mm -hmm. very nice. And, and they also release the tax that is a decentralized exchange. And, and it's nice because it, it has some algorithms that avoid from running or slippage because one of the problems of the RSK swap, Uniswap is that they, you have a slippage. Sometimes you, you know, if you let, you put market orders, then the price you get can go very low. So, so I think that's, um, that's an improvement or at least an alternative, depending on the use case you want to use RSK swap or text. But that for me is also a very nice development in, in the RSK ecosystem. Yeah, but, so but now we have a stable asset, uh, mm. We have two DEXs, truly true DEXs, and also sovereign chess launch that has margin trading, lending. So the, the full picture of a fully decentralized peer-to-peer -peer monetary system and financial system is becoming to life mm -hmm. after five years, yes. Interesting, interesting. But no, but on the RSK uh, swap website, though, you obviously don't have um, Ethereum, uh, what's it called, uh, assets, right? Crypto assets. It's all going to be stuff that's obviously built on uh, RSK, not, right? Not yet, but with the mm. peg that we build, we are starting to move. In, in, indeed, we have our DAI. There are DAI living on the RSK network. So with the pay we created with Ethereum, you will start seeing a lot of the assets on Ethereum being ported to, to RSK. So because it does it does kind of confuse me a little. Well, maybe not, but the, you know the fact that people are taking so many bitcoins and putting them on the Ethereum network scares me a little bit because it's like you know you're taking it from potentially a more secure environment to less one. And 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 you would think RSK would be the answer to that question, but. You know, I've also been following all these guys and Vitalik, everyone on Twitter. And, and you know, he, I think Vitalik even made some comments recently about whether it be like towards Blockstream or, you know, mm -hmm. side chains in general, how it is in itself, you know, decentralized due to the limitations that you mentioned. But those limitations exist. And uh, and so I guess it is to somewhat a fair criticism. But as an entrepreneur, right, for me, I'm trying to solve problems. And so I'm curious to know, how one is supposed to figure out what is more de like, let's say you're building a DEX, let's say you're building a P2P platform, let's say you're building something and you're saying, okay, I want to decentralize it because there is a chance that someone might come and shut it yeah. down and you want to serve this kind of global mission. But then how do you make that decision? You know, Gabriel, by the way, just to, just to say, said, build it on both. You know, that was his answer. He said, you know, if you're going to do something, build it on both. But just curious, what, what, what like how, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on it? I, I think, you know, the safest way to interact with Bitcoin from a smart contracts is RSK. There's no, I mean, that's the truth. It's like, it's a fact. It's like, you know, the security levels that you have on RSK to deal with Bitcoin are much higher than any of the RAP BTC systems in existence anywhere else. So I, I think it depends on, on how 
keen or worried about security you are it's like let's say some to the most say, let's say to the most let's say you're like super worried so what, why would you consider let's say building an rsk well uh, I, i think what what will happen is like this is not an absolute and i've been discussing this with bitcoiners a lot it's like you know you, you are the, the, the bitcoins that you have for long-term store of value you're not going to take them out of of bitcoin indeed Even the bitcoins that were moved to Ethereum are, are a lot. Uh, uh, well, not moved, but wrapped in Ethereum are a lot. They are still maybe 1% of the bitcoins of the world. So in, in terms of relative value, it's like, it's not much. It's like, you know, and, and I think that will stay like that. We never expected RSK to become, to, to overthrow Bitcoin because for us, it's like saying, okay, Bitcoin is a store of value, but this is store of value the safer we, we can create you know the safest environment we can create is by the by doing this and that's what rsk is about like creating the safest environment to 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 interact with bitcoin in a smart contract or decentralized finance environment so but we expect people to have the store of value still in bitcoin and and only transfer to rsk the bitcoins that they need to interact with with more complex protocols so so if you say okay I want to get a, lend, a, a loan against my Bitcoins with Dollar on Chain or Ardai or any other stable asset. Rupee on Chain? No, okay. Rupee oh, yeah. on Chain, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, that was my original idea. Yeah. On yeah. Chain. But, but, you know, to, to have a local currency. Mm. So if you start doing that, so, so I can give you like, you know, put my Bitcoin in collateral in a peer-to-peer, -peer, in a decentralized uh, protocol. So I know... There's no counterparty risk. There's only platform risk. You know? so, so I put my Bitcoins there and then I get a loan. I'd rather do that than go to a centralized system. It's, I mean, unless, but that's a, an interesting thing because as platforms are still very young and, and mature, some people would rather be in the hands of a centralized entity they trust than be in a decentralized protocol that is not uh, sufficiently proven from their perspective. And, and I think that's okay. That's, that, that's part of the, pro, the moment we are. It, five years from now, as RSK matures, stabilizes, becomes you know, safer, more, more cemented, more uh, ossifies as well, like Bitcoin is ossifying, very likely people won't think twice about like saying, no, if, if I need to go to a centralized party to, to get a loan on my Bitcoin, I'd rather go to RSK. Because that, that will be the, the, but RSK is only two years and a half. Uh, I mean, we are, all the software pieces need to go through a hardening process. That's, that's a security term they mm. use. No? And that hardening process never takes less than a couple of years. That's why we were so conservative in many things with RSK, because we, we know that this process, I mean, Sergio is a security expert, uh, our Chief security officer is one of the top hackers in, in the world. So, so we we have we are we have this security consciousness in, in our software development and processes. We understand that this needs to happen. That that doesn't mean that we are like you know exempt of any problems, that, but we try to to take risk in an incremental way. That's why the pair with Bitcoin had some limits and those limits were raised and eventually will be removed when we feel the whole setup is secure enough and hard enough. So. Got it. Got it. Hey, Diego, you know, oh, man, I could talk to you forever, but I just realized we've just did two hours. I don't, I want to be mindful of your calendar and your time. Uh, this was fascinating. You know, I'm not going to lie. I, I, uh, I, I mean, if you, I don't expect you to because you're super busy, but if you look at my 50, 60 interviews, I probably bring up RSK uh, one out of every three <laughs> uh, interviews because I think about it a lot. And, you know, I, 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 I'm a Bitcoiner, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist, and I, you know, even having been so close to Ethereum, I publicly have, you know, stated that I, I did not get in on the ICO or whatever you <laughs> want to call it. I did not, you know, um, and, and a lot of those concerns that I had are in the early days, to some extent still remain. And, and therefore, you know, as I think about the next stage of, of, you know, projects that I'm working on, um, you know, money is like, I want to keep Bitcoin as is. I love it. You know, I don't want to like change too much to it. By the same time, you know, I, 
like whether you think about social media, like you said, whether you think about, you know, financial uh, platforms and lending and whatever it is, like, I want to see these things happen on, on the, on the decentralized network, ideally the best yeah. one that I know of, which is Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I love what you guys are doing and uh yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'd love to be a bit more helpful. And if I could, I don't know, at least, you know, um, yeah, help in any way. Okay. So in terms of a closing, Diego, what, what, what do you want to share with people in terms of where people can learn more about RSK? You know, we're going to share with, with the million and a half people at UnoCoin and, um, and our network in Canada through Paycase and stuff. So I want to, where, where can, yeah, people learn about the project and then you as well. Yes. I think to know about, the, the network is rsk.co is, is the main website um, where you will see or you will find all the resources for developers, but also for people willing to use the, the open finance protocols running on, on RSK. Uh, so that's the, that's the way to go. On a personal level, I'm, I'm mostly on Twitter. My, my nickname is Dieguito, like little Diego, D-I-E-G-U-I-T-O. Mm. Uh, so, um, I think that's the way to follow me and, and reach out to me. Cool. And I think as a closing thought, mm. I think, you know, as I told you, I think when I started with Bitcoin, it was more about an intuition, but I think all the technology to turn Bitcoin into the financial system or financial infrastructure of the future is already here. I think we will see that like. Uh, re regarding your your thoughts no, on I would like to see this happening on Bitcoin. We are already there. Of course, the technology needs to mature maybe two, three more years to stabilize the, the different components. But um, the nice thing is that we have a way of like serving the world with Bitcoin as, as a foundation layer uh, with all these other protocols. So, so I'm very, I'm, I mean, I was a believer. Now I'm just riding the ride. I think we are in, it's an amazing moment to be alive and, and people will see how Bitcoin becomes the financial infrastructure of the future. And, and the process of turning Bitcoin into that also is an economic process. It's like we need to go transferring value from the traditional infrastructure into the new infrastructure. And that will be a process that in my opinion will take a decade uh, so regardless of the financial, uh, of the technical aspects, but, but we are on the way and, and I'm more positive than ever in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I realize more and more, the more time I spend in this space, Diego, that it's not about win, lose, you know, whether it's like competitors, whether it's competing crypto assets, even, I think like it's all about the free markets and it's about ideas and it's about them coming together and you know i love debating ideas and whatnot and, and i think uh yeah yeah this is a pretty pretty exciting industry every single day is like, <laughs> uh, mind mind blowing okay buddy I, I will let you go diego and if you want to do a follow-up you know next week next month next year yes, whenever you're free absolutely. i'm down yes. and even if you want to do it if you want to send me some more of your technical guys to do deep dives where we do screen shares and go into the code and go into like applications and show people demos and this and that you know you know with Unicorn we're back now um and with with all the different projects i'm a part of they're they're kind of kicking into high gear and so i yeah i think it's time so it's, it's time that we all start uh, you know collaborating more thank, thank you sunny i take your word on it uh, and thank you for gen your generosity and for inviting me here great pleasure awesome buddy okay i'm gonna kill it here thank you very much <laughs>